Well, thank, thank you everybody for joining us for the first IAA webinar uh, of 2022. We have, a we have a quite a nice program for the rest of the year, but for today, I'm super excited to have with us four excellent um, uh, economists uh, who will talk to us about uh, export diversification in Iran and discuss both opportunities, but also challenges. I'm super grateful to Sada for organizing this session and chairing this session. And um, I'll, I'll hand over to him. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Kamya. Uh, good evening in case you are in Iran. Good afternoon in case you are in Europe. And good morning in case you are in the US or Canada. Uh, this is an honor for me to introduce the members of this uh, wonderful panel. I am going to introduce them in the order that they are going to talk. Each of them will talk for 15 minutes. And after they are done with their presentation, they are going to uh, address some of the questions and concerns that are raised by uh, the members of the uh, IIEA or the others who have joined the IIEA webinar here. And I will be moderating this particular panel. Uh, I begin with the introduction of Dr. Daria Taglioni. I am going to drop uh, her academic title here from now on. Daria is a research manager in trade and international integration and development research group at the World Bank. She has joined the World Bank in 2011. Prior to that, she has been with ECB as well as OECD. She has published many papers that includes her papers in the American Economic Review, Journal of International Economics, The World Economy, and the list goes on and on and on. And she has also authored uh, various books and reports on international trade. I would like to mention that she has this very famous NBER working paper, uh, which is read by generations of graduate students in international economics, in particular trade. It is entitled Gravity for Dummies and Dummies for Gravity Equation. Uh, just so you know how famous this paper is, I checked it out. This paper was published in 2006, and so far it has received more than 1,600 citations. In case you don't have that on your syllabus for a graduate trade course, you got to add that paper there. Uh, her work has also been featured in many international media outlets that includes New York Times and Forbes. She is originally Italian and holds a PhD in international economics from the Graduate Institute in Geneva. That leads me to Dr. Werker. Uh, again, I'm going to drop his academic title. Eric is uh, currently a William Saywell professor at the Media School of Business at Simon Fraser University. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington, DC. And he is an advisor to the Liberia Program for the International Growth Center in London. He is a non-resident senior research fellow at the UN University in Helsinki as well. From 2005 to 2015, he was an assistant and then an associate professor at Harvard Business School. He then left the United States, joining uh, UFS. Perhaps he was homesick. He went back to Canada. And uh, regardless of where he has been, he has been on numerous policy groups and engaged in policy research over the last 20 years. He has published in Journal of Political Economy, Journal of Development Economics, World Development, and again, the list goes on and on. And he has also published a recent book entitled Deals and Development, the political economy and, sorry, the political dynamics of growth episodes. In case you are interested in development topics, in particular topics that relate to Africa, this is a wonderful read. Uh, one of his most famous papers, I thought I should mention this, which appeared in uh, Journal of Political Economy is entitled, How Much is a Seat on the Security Council Worth? foreign aid and bribery at the United Nations. So far, I checked, this paper has received more than, uh, well, close to 1,000 citations. It's a very famous paper in case you have read some uh, empirical work on uh, observed data rather than uh, 
randomized trials and such. His work has been featured in international media outlets that includes, again, the New York Times, Forbes, and the Atlantics. And again, the list goes on and on. He's originally Canadian, as I mentioned earlier, and holds a PhD from Harvard. And that leads me to Dr. Beshkar. Uh, again, I'm going to drop his academic title. Mustafa is an associate professor of economics at Indiana University. He is also an affiliated faculty at the Ostrom Workshop at Indiana University. Prior to joining Indiana, Mustafa was visiting Yale University as well as Purdue University. And even he has spent a few years at University of New Hampshire before joining Indiana where he is now an associate professor. Uh, the list of publications that Mustafa had put forth is quite impressive, just like Daria and Eric. I'm going to mention a few outlets in which his publications have appeared so far. That includes the Journal of International Economics, Journal of Monetary Economics, International Economic Review, and it can go on and on and on. He has also contributed to the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Economics and Finance, as well as Elsevier's Handbook of Commercial Policy. Since 2020, he has been serving as an associate editor in Quarterly Review of Economics and Finance. Uh, I also have to mention, since this is double IEA, that uh, Mustafa has co-authored many papers with uh, Iranian economists who reside in the US. That includes a paper with uh, Ali Shurideh, who is at Carnegie Mellon, a paper with Ahmad Lashkaripur, who is also at Indiana, a very nice trade economist, and also a paper with uh, Mahdi Majburi, who is at Babson College. Uh, no need to mention, because many of you actually know him, Mustafa is originally from Iran. He holds a PhD in economics from Vanderbilt University. I serve as the moderator of this session, so I should introduce myself. My name is Saleh. My last name is Sahabeh Tabrizi. I am an associate professor at uh, Tom Love Division of uh, Entrepreneurship and Economic Development at Price College of Business at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we are going to go after the first topic of today's presentation. This presentation is going to be done by Daya. The title of this topic uh, of this presentation is Mercantile Trade, Global Value Chain and Development. Then we follow with a presentation done by Eric. The title is Resource Abundance resource dependence and export diversification. And then we will follow that with a presentation by Mustafa on trade agreements and export diversification. Daria, floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, and let me say that I'm very happy to be uh, speaking at this panel. I look forward from um, hearing from the other panelists, but also uh, from the questions. So let me share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, all right. Oops. Okay. So um, the. Daria, what, we yes? do not see the full screen. We see the screen oh. that manages those different slides. All right. Let me do this. Let's see. Is it better now? We still see, yes, we see the full screen now. Great. OK. Um, so um, when Saleh got in touch um, to ask about a presentation, he asked to make the connection between global value chains, uh, diversification, and then development. And so um, I, I, I think that the, really the best place to to start is the World Development Report, which we worked on two years ago at the World Bank, and of which I was uh, one of the leading authors. And, um, and I will try to, to really discuss this connection in light of the findings of, uh, of that report. So the, the premise of uh, why we care for development about openness and global value chains in particular is that um, uh, it is summarized in this slide. This is work by Penelope Goldberg and uh, Tristan Reed um, when Penny was still the chief economist at the World Bank. And so the question they asked is, 
Is it possible for countries in the world to achieve sustained poverty reduction without trading? And so what they found is the following. They ranked countries from the poorest countries to the richest countries. And this is by buckets of 10% of uh, the sites. And uh, they found that, um, and they estimated the uh, reduction in poverty, which is the, uh, the blue bars and the red bars that could be achieved uh, with an internationally integrated economy, the blue bar, and then uh, by operating in a closed economy, the red bar. And so what you find there is that uh, they made some simulation. They looked at what would be the minimum threshold uh, of market size needed for sustained poverty reduction, which they estimated that uh, 328 million people uh, as, a, as an average market size for sustained poverty reduction. And what they found actually is that 50% uh, of the countries worldwide wouldn't be able to achieve sustained poverty reduction be, be, without being integrated in the global economy. And so I would say the, 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 the great majority of the World Bank client countries need trade openness to actually develop. And that's really the strong premise of why we worry about international trade and of why this is not really replaceable for many countries in our opinion. And so then uh, the, the whole report uh, of uh, that uh, two years ago uh, was about trying to understand within this framework, uh, global value chains. Global value chain represents about 50% of international trade. And, um, and, and in some respects, they are a special. Uh, and so we were asking really what's special about global value chains and is there um, um, a compound effect on growth compared to traditional trade? And if that's the case, why? And how does uh, and how do they help diversification? And how this help to the to diversification is different from the one that might come from traditional trade. So just um, you know, the, I think there are many uh, many definitions of global value chain floating around, and the reason is that there are different communities of researchers that work on this topic. But just for the purpose of this talk, and you know, from a trade perspective, we can uh, think of a global value chain really of the mechanism of importing to transform something to export. And so we can imagine a stylized uh, you know, chain, but in reality, they're not chains, they are networks of production. But let's say that, uh, let's assume that it's a chain. We have the first country that participate by being very upstream with commodities, with raw materials, but also with research and development. Let's assume that this country does only this upstream activities. And so its participation would be all forward, meaning it exports to other countries that transform and then sell to the global markets. Then um, country two is the case where of countries that are in the middle, they take inputs commodities, research and development from other countries, they transform, produce parts and components. It could be semiconductors, for instance, or other semi-finished goods, and then they re-export uh, for the global markets. And then there are countries that are a bit closer to the consumers, where you know there, it's one step, for instance, that has served well China in the early phases of industrialization, or the Philippines for that matter. It's a country that mostly take inputs from other countries, assembles, and then sells the finished goods abroad. So, and we call this type of countries as having predominantly backward participation. So when we will think about the type of trade that happens in this mechanism, we will think of this sort of three different types of countries, countries that participate upstream with predominantly forward participation, countries that uh, participate predominantly downstream with backward participations in countries in the middle. Um, yeah, okay, so why, why this matters? So we, we really you know, debated a lot about what's special about global value chains compared to traditional trade. 
where traditional trade, uh, let's say, by and large, we can say, I produce something in my country, I sell it to a consumer in another country. So it's, uh, you know, all the production happens in my country and I export to another country. So what is special about it is that in global value chains, you tend to have hyper specialization compared to trade. So countries uh, and, and firms tend to be specialized in specific tasks. And this is something that we've been hearing for the last 20 years. But I think even more important, and I think it's really key to the growth, uh, um, to the growth um, dividend of global value chains, is that uh, the, the trade relationships between firms of different countries are not one of transactions at arm's length. So they're actually repeated interactions um, where countries, where companies from different countries really enter in sort of uh, informal long-term partnerships. It's a bit more like marriages than, uh, than you know, like the what uh, traditional trade models would uh, assume. And so we think that these two characteristics, hyper-specialization and firm-to-firm -firm relationships is what actually allows uh, the, the growth uh, to take place. And I will say more uh, on that uh, in a little while. Um, so the other point is that uh, um, all countries in the world participate in global value chains, but in different ways. And it's really about this um, you know, backward forward participation. So we have some countries that specialize, that have a low participation, but, um, but it's predominantly with commodities. There are other countries that participate a lot more, again, with commodities. Uh, then there is, and, and, and this is really a critical phase in growth, is when countries that specialize in commodities jump into mass manufacturing. So there is something special about that moment in, in, in the growth and in the development uh, of the countries that make that jump. Um, and then, a number of these countries managed to move from limited manufacturing to a more diversified base, and then eventually to advanced manufacturing and to services. And then finally, there is um, a number of countries that uh, jumped into innovative activities. Uh, to be noted, even the countries, even if uh, you know, it says, okay, innovative activities clearly are all the rich countries, but they weren't having this specialization even as, early, uh, as late as 20 years ago. So you, you had the several of these rich countries, uh, Canada, my own Italy, uh, Spain, uh, um, that were actually um, more in the advanced manufacturing. So it's a dynamic, uh, it, it's a dynamic setting. It's, um, you know, countries, uh, so one of the messages I will say at the end of the presentations is that um, you know, there are um, forces, endowments that uh, determine where you are in this value chain uh, production, but this doesn't need to determine destiny. Policies can make a lot to change uh, that pattern. So, but for, before speaking about determinants, let me speak about uh, the link between global value chains and diversification. So at the basis of this, we find that firms that are in global value chain tend to be more productive than other firms. So because of data limitations, we had to make an assumption of what firms are in value chains. And so we took firms that both import and export, and we compare their productivity compared to firms that either neither import or export or only import or only export. And so what we find in all countries for which we had the uh, customs data, which is about 70 countries in the world, we find that there is always this fact, the productivity of firms that both import and export, it's always bigger than any other form of firm. Daria, five minutes. Yeah. Yes, okay. The second point, as I said, is that countries uh, grow most when they jump into simple manufacturing. So there is something about scale of production um, there uh, that matters. 
And the third point is, uh, and it's, I think, the most important link with diversification, is that basically what happens at this point is that uh, when countries join global value chains, they go into more capital intensive activities. But because they go into more capital intensive activities, they are able to produce at greater scale and therefore have also higher employment in aggregate. Although the employment per unit of production is lower than at uh, simpler forms of engagement. And I think this is really the key. So diversification happens because there is capital intensive and because this long standing firm to firm relationships actually lead to knowledge building and, cap and capabilities building in a country. And then um, the scale of production that is achieved through global value chain, uh, through global value chains, which is bigger than the one that could be achieved only with traditional trade or uh, being in autarky, uh, leads to aggregate employment effects. But the type of uh, employment is obviously uh, as a skill bias. So I think that's really the twist here. And then, of course, because they lead to growth and to employment, uh, countries that get in global value chains also achieve poverty reduction. So the one question we ask is, is this a story of the past? And I, I don't have the time to go into that, but we find that actually technology doesn't change this picture. We find that, for instance, if we look at automation in the countries of the north, and uh, demand for parts and components from the countries of the south of the world, we find that it's precisely in those sectors that have automated the more that we actually find the most demand for parts and components. And so um, the, the downside, there are also many downsides in this type of in, in engaging in global value chains. There are many and many dimensions, but the, 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 the point is that the gains are shared unequally. So there is, um, you know, there is an, an agenda to actually sort out on, on redistributing the gains uh, from global value chains more equally across countries and within countries. And so finally, I said that, uh, you know, we looked at the drivers and so geography matters, endowments matter, institutions matters and access to market, to a, to a, to a sizable market matters for global value chains to work. And, and then to deliver outcomes. Um, but as I said, uh, uh, the, 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 the endowments do not need to determine destiny and policies of openness, connectivity and cooperation go a long way to make this uh, whole engine work. And so in, in the report, we actually, we have a whole set of policies that can help, but I think really important uh, and, and I, uh, you know, and I think it can be interesting for the debate later is countries with a small domestic market size or remote location like uh, Iran, of course, trade facilitation and transport liberalization and trade agreements would be fundamental to make this work. And so I think this is a, the big elephant in the room for Iran, uh, which we can discuss. And then, of course, uh, you know, to step into more advanced uh, activities there are uh, you know more uh, an agenda more on the soft side of skill development r and d capacity and ipr protection but i think for iran really you know we 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 need to to sort out this agenda here thank you I stop it here thank you so very much daria you were right on time and i'm grateful for that so I would like to mention, before we open the floor to Eric, I would like to mention that you may type in your questions into the Q&A section. I would appreciate it if you could please identify to whom you are raising that question. And after that, we're going to uh, open the floor to all the questions, and we know all the questions that are raised in the Q&A, and we will attend to them. Eric, floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Great. Well, again, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. Uh, I, I'm, I come at this not as a trade economist, so that's my first confession, but as a political economist. So my, my uh, focus is, is as much on understanding the political economy of resource-rich countries 
and thinking not so much about diversification per se, but, but similar to Daria, uh, its role in, in enabling wider prosperity. Um, so why might diversification matter for resource rich countries? When you, when you study uh, resource rich countries, uh, the first thing that comes up often is the so-called resource curse, which includes bad governance, corruption and violence. And, and pretty much any paper that looks into a policy uh, solution for it will recommend almost as a first step that the country should diversify its economy as a way to get around that issue. It turns out there's less information and, and publications on the success of diversification and the enablers of that. So I've done a couple of recent papers on that that I'll describe a little bit. A second pr problem of resource dependence is the problem of Dutch disease, where the resources push out the competitiveness of other uh, uh, manufactured and, and potentially service exports. Now, diversification, in, in addition to solving these, these challenges, it's, it's, has, has been found to uh, enable convergence to higher income. Cesar Hidalgo and Ricardo Hausman, who, who studied economic complexity and wrote about the monkeys and the trees, uh, found that countries that were more diversified and that exported to wealthier countries themselves converged to higher incomes. And diversification can also enable, not surprisingly, more resilience to commodity price shocks, uh, which can make the economies less volatile and also lead to higher income. Now, measuring diversification, there are a number of different ways. And, and the primary focus on export diversification, in my view, is, is as someone interested in resource-rich countries, is often because the data is so much better. But with respect to just generating prosperity, diversification in the domestic economy uh, that might not necessarily get exported or traded across borders, despite all the benefits, such as from global value chains that Daria mentioned, can also be really important. And then a World Bank-led effort also has looked at uh, diversification of wealth. That is, there can be human capital and physica physical capital or infrastructure in addition to the subsoil non-renewable assets in the ground. Now, here's a picture of some export uh, diversification from Iran. I won't go into much except for point out the big brown section that is related to hydrocarbons, which is a vast share of the goods exports from Iran. And then you can see a little bit in terms of chemicals and the purple. And uh, only once we get down to the bottom right do we see more uh, kind of complex manufactured uh, items. But when you compare this to other resource dependent countries, Iran actually re looks really good here. Uh, or if you looked at Iran back in the 1970s, the brown box would be a much larger share of the total uh, export package. Now, if we just focus on standard measures of export diversification, uh, a most, uh, the most common one would be share of non-resource uh, exports being a measure of diversification or something more fancy like a Herfindahl index or the economic complexity index. We can get into measurement issues looking at a country over time and it can be illustrated with this simple example. Imagine a country that in 2008 has about half of its export basket and oil, and the remainder in cars, wheat, and computers. Now in 2010, it looks like it's more about a equal shares across those four categories. Those of you who know commodity markets might, might have observed that the price of oil fell uh, dramatically over this period. And that, or the depletion of an oil asset uh, from, from, from uh, extracting it, uh, could lead to an inferred increase in diversification if we were going to look at one of these concentration or share measures. And uh, Michael Ross noted this in a 2019 paper looking at evidence of diversification in resource rich countries or oil rich countries. So in, in, the, in the two papers I'll describe, one is with Adisu Lashitu, who's at uh, McMaster University now in the Brookings, uh, and Michael uh, Ross at UCLA. Uh, we use different measures, basically focusing on per capita measures of non-resource exports production and wealth. So the, in that case, the view of diversification is not so much the number of products I make and their complexity, uh, but rather just the ability to make stuff outside of the resource sector, kind of trying to ignore what's going on inside uh, the commodity market, both production and, and price-wise. And then just to illustrate this over time, looking at Iran, 
um, where these are the different categories that corresponded to the colors as produced by the Atlas of Economic Complexity. We can see here that Iran's export profile really moves dramatically and it looks like it's driven just by changes in the commodity market as well as uh, uh, the, the impact of sanctions. But if you look at all the other colors besides the brown, we can see here from before 2000, they were quite small. And then after 2012, they get larger. So our, our view is that we should we want to look at that and, and understand that growth over time to see sort of that fundamental uh, uh, diversification that occurs over a longer time horizon. So I, I promised to talk about resource dependence and abundance. What's the difference? Resource abundance is, think of it as the, the amount of natural resources available in the ground per person. Uh, a country that has a lot of stuff or that's very valuable and a small population would be resource abundant. Resource dependence, on the other hand, is the, sh the share or the dominance of natural resource in the economy, whether it's resource rents as a percent of GDP, resource exports as a share of total exports, or revenue collected from resource production as a share of government revenue. And, and the, the, the short story is we find very different results when we look at countries that are resource dependent versus resource abundant. Uh, Iran in the 1970s, we categorized is highly resource dependent. Okay, so this is from the first paper that we published last year in the World Bank Research Obser uh, Observer, and it's more kind of a country by country trying to understand the successes in a, in a descriptive way, just, just recognizing the sort of uh, limited development of this, of this uh, sub sub field of, of research. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you though a couple high level results that can illustrate some of the findings. So uh, this little chart uh, shows how we compare countries that we classified as resource rich in the 1970s versus resource poor, and then their performance in these different uh, measures of diversification over the next um, 35 years. So as you can see here, uh, looking at manufacturing value added, or in other words, the domestic uh, side of manufacturing, resource poor countries had a higher per capita growth rate uh, manufacturing exports, the numbers flip. So res resource rich countries actually had a higher growth in manufacturing exports. And when you look and you dig a little bit deeper, it seems like much of that manufacturing where we want to capture them making computers, in fact, it's just the processing of hydrocarbons uh, into sort of, you know, a more refined version of it. So it's not necessarily the diversification we want from like a fundamental view of the economy being divorced from the, the fortunes of the oil market. On the service sector, we find significant differences where resource poor countries had uh, faster growth in both exports as well as uh, domestic uh, service production. Another broad finding is that even resource rich countries, whereas the narrative is like, oh yeah, it's impossible to diversify, we do find uh, per, per capita improvements in the non-resource uh, uh, sectors uh, over time. And that's just a headline result. The growth is slower in general, but it's there. So as I mentioned, Iran, uh, which we classified as highly resource dependent, um, has fairly typical diversification performance. It's fairly strong, but it's weaker on services as with other resource rich countries, and it's stronger on manufactured uh, exports. Um, and to give a sense of the resource dependence versus abundance in the 1970s, uh, there was about $4,000 in resource rents per capita in Iran compared to 40,000 uh, in Saudi. Now, one of the things we looked at was whether countries' competitive capabilities or the sort of underlying drivers of potential diversification uh, differ between countries that are rich in natural resources based on their level of resource uh, intensity. And on the left, we, we correlate these measures of, of competitive capabilities by resource dependence. So this is, again, how large resources are in your economy. And you can see here strong negative correlations with different measures of human capital development, public and intellectual capital, and business capacity de development. Whereas in the right column, which looks at a, a measure of resource abundance, we actually see, if anything, positive correlations. And that countries that just have a lot of stuff in the ground per person are able to uh, have higher human development, more public capital expenditure, and then a higher rate of firm entry. Uh, in a second paper, which Michael and I have just uh, uh, 
shared with the World Bank. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. <laughs> I'm sure it's a different project uh, for a flagship uh, report background paper that will turn into an article this year. Uh, we look at sub-Saharan African countries uh, and, and, and try to understand the impact of the commodity super cycle over the last couple of decades on diversification performance. And again, it's, it's more country by country, but here, just looking at the headline, we compare resource rich countries with resource poor countries. And we can see here that resource poor countries have increased their manufactured exports by 55% compared to 3% at the median value and service exports by 81% compared to 18% at the median value. So we, hear a, we see here a stronger performance in, in export diversification in resource poor countries in Africa. Another observation, like before, there's still improvement even in resource rich countries. Uh, and the third observation is that the numbers are really small. So we're talking $50 per person in, in, in exports for these levels. So when you think from a policy perspective of what it means to improve diversification, it can literally mean focusing on a single level, single industry like fisheries or, or, or floriculture, improving that and suddenly you might actually be fairly competitive compared to other resource rich countries in your diversification. Um, looking at domestic diversification, it looks a little bit stronger uh, for resource rich countries. Their manufacturing sectors increased faster than resource poor countries. Again, some of this is just capturing the, the processing of, of primary commodities. Um, but then when we look at services, as well as the growth of non-resource based wealth, that is human capital and infrastructure, again, resource poor countries are, 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 are growing faster, albeit from a slightly lower base. So the story in African diversification is that resource rich countries started richer, diversified slower. And Very five yeah, minutes. Gotcha. Um, and resource rich uh, countries, we also looked at measures of kind of the broader national uh, correlates of, of prosperity, uh, resource rich countries made slower progress in, in the human development index, albeit they made, you know, fairly close and significant progress. And both groups of countries failed to improve on their governance scores. But for resource rich countries, those governance scores were much lower to begin with. So why uh, is diversification harder in resource dependent countries? We proposed some answers related to these, these, um, this descriptive data, uh, but first the caveat is that it might be a little bit easier like we see with the manufacturing results. And that's with the ability to do diversification in the linkages sector uh, or, or linkages to the natural resource sector. Uh, but like I said earlier, it might not be the diversification we want because it could still leave the country vulnerable to price swings and in addition, uh, it could present some of the same political challenges uh, in terms of dependence on, on the rents. But the two broader reasons why it's harder in resource rich countries, one is the economics. Uh, between Dutch disease and what uh, Hausman and Hidalgo would, would refer to the isolated product space of resource sectors, that is, it's harder to jump from oil production to computers than it is from light manufacturing uh, to computers. Um, which, which means that the country is naturally less competitive in, in producing new products, and those new products will be what drive uh, the diversification. A second economic issue that's really more political economic, and this relates to the, uh, the book that Salad described, was uh, that's with, joint with Lant Pritchett and Kunal Sen, which is that business and government is likely then to specialize in rent seeking and distribution as opposed to manufacturing capabilities and, and lower costs and trade access and regulating such industries. Um, and on the political economy side, diversification is harder because resource rich countries generally have weaker institutions and governance, which makes it harder to support and regulate the types of activities that are more complex that have, that have probably greater linkages to global value chains. So I'm just, uh, that's, that's not something we tested specifically. And so starting with lower governance and having that governance specialize in rent uh, seeking and rent distribution, uh, or not, 
In other words, the, the political uh, contestation that occurs in resource rich countries is more likely to re revolve around those rent producing sectors. And then these problems feed back into one another. The lower economic competitiveness increases the political focus uh, on the sectors that are competitive, but which don't lead to broader uh, regulatory and institutional development. So I'll stop there. Here's some of the, the work that I cited. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Eric, for uh, the presentation and wrapping that up just right on time. I saw that Daria addressed some of the questions that were raised in q and I bet Eric will also do that if he wants to address them uh, by typing them, or if he wants to address them publicly, he can also do that. Uh, now let's go to Mustafa. Mustafa, you have 15 minutes and floor is yours. Unmute myself. Thank you, Saleh, for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, Daria and Eric did a great job of explaining what, uh, why uh, diversification and uh, export diversification matters. So I will try to comment on the role of trade agreements here. So as uh, Daria and Eric mentioned, uh, what you export basically matters for your long-term growth. And there is uh, a lot of evidence on that. Uh, so in the case of Iran, uh, uh, we know that petroleum oil, uh, crude oil, is a major export of Iran. Uh, before the sanctions in 2011, it was 70% of the exports from the country. And right after the sanctions were imposed, uh, it was 57% and it declined uh, even further. So uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, there is a problem of measurement here that all of a sudden Iran looks a lot more diversified, but in fact, that was uh, a direct result of the sanctions. But the bottom line is that Iran is uh, very much dependent on exports of uh, oil. And if, it, uh, if Iran wants to have uh, fast growth, it needs to diversify its economy and its exports. So here, the question that I will try to ad address is uh, whether trade agreements help or hinder the diversification of oil exporting developing economies. And this is not, uh, there's not a very obvious answer to this because uh, trade agreements impose restrictions on the policy space of governments. Therefore, it could actually uh, reduce the ability of the governments to uh, devise plans and strategies to diversify their economies. So let's look at, uh, very quickly, I will look at the, uh, the relationship between the GATT and the WTO and uh, oil exporting countries. So generally, they had a very difficult relationship over time. So if, if you look at the uh, major oil exporting countries, they had a lot less activity in these agreements. So look at the OPEC founding members, for example. So GATT was established in uh, late 1940s, but Kuwait was the first OPEC member that joined the GATT in 1965. And then it took a couple of decades uh, for Venezuela to join a second OPEC member. And then it, uh, Saudi Arabia was not a member until 2005, and the process of accession for Saudi Arabia was very difficult. And Iran and Iraq, as you know, they are still outside the system. And other OPEC members uh, were also relative late comers to these agreements. Uh, and those OPEC members that joined the GATT and the WTO, they had a very uh, difficult time. So, in, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia finally joined the WTO, but uh, as soon as it joined the WTO, there were calls to oust uh, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, in fact, from the WTO. And these calls were from the US and there were many anti-dumping measures that were imposed against Saudi Arabia that I will explain a little bit. So a US Senator uh, uh, distributed a report and wanted to have a legislation to require the US government to go to the WTO and for, uh, file a formal dispute um, against Saudi Arabia because of its restrictions on oil export. Because uh, as he mentioned, or uh, this was at least his uh, uh, view of this system, that if you are a part of a monopoly like OPEC, which restricts international trade, you cannot belong to the WTO. And uh, so that, uh, that uh, bill in the US Senate didn't get anywhere, but it shows how difficult 
uh, what a difficult relationship oil exporting countries have uh, with uh, some principles in the WTO. And uh, even after the, uh, Saudi Arabia joined the WTO, it was uh, facing many uh, restrictions that were basically extra restrictions like anti-dumping measures uh, against its exports. Countries like European Union, uh, Turkey, India, uh, they all imposed uh, anti-dumping duties on the export of petrochemical products from the US uh, based on the allegation that uh, this, the prices that they charged were not normal prices. And as you might know, in the WTO, you have these extra protection measures that you can adopt in case uh, prices uh, or export prices are uh, below normal prices and uh, Saudi Arabia was not able to enjoy uh, the kind of market access that it predicted to have after joining the WTO. So what is the root cause of this uh, difficult relationship between uh, oil exporting developing countries and the WTO? I think the, uh, the basic answer to that question is that GATT, uh, which was the, the agreement before the WTO, it was mainly about the exchange of market access. But market access is not an important issue when it comes to oil exports, because uh, there are many countries that are heavily dependent on imported oil. So they are going to buy oil uh, anyway. So even if you don't have a trade agreement, so therefore uh, that provides very little incentive. Market access exchange provides little incentive for oil exporting countries to join the system. And if you join the system, basically, if you are Iran or Saudi Arabia, you join the GATT, you will face a lot of restrictions on your policy space. At the same time, you don't care really about the market access that is provided. At least when you have a static view, most of your export is oil and, you, uh, that, uh, and uh, market access is not an issue. Uh, the result is, of course, a lack of enthusiasm to join the GATT and the WTO by these countries. On the other hand, as I uh, mentioned a little uh, mentioned earlier, so the obligations that countries have under OPEC and GATT and the WTO, they seem to be uh, in conflict. That is, GATT Article 11 prohibits export uh, restrictions, but OPEC is basically an organization that uh, requires its members to limit their export. And there are export quotas that these countries have to follow. And this, this was the basis of Lautenberg's report that, uh, so these uh, two organizations have these uh, conflicting obligations. And in the, uh, in the GATT, so in the Tokyo round of uh, multilateral trade negotiations, which occurred in 1970s, uh, that coincided with the oil embargo crisis of 1973 and four. And the US in that uh, round of negotiation uh, proposed some initiatives that targeted uh, the oil exporting nations. And the idea was to establish rules against export restrictions and dual pricing practices that uh, oil exporting countries have. Dual, practice, uh, dual pricing practices are basically keeping the domestic price of oil and gasoline and uh, other uh, oil products cheaper than the uh, world price. And that is called dual pricing. Uh, so again, that shows how difficult it was for OPEC members and major oil exporting developing countries to join the w, uh, join the GATT and then the WTO. So given all of that, this uh, gives a very uh, uh, you know, disappointing view about the benefits of trade agreements for oil exporting countries, but the image may not be as bad as uh, uh, I just mentioned because, so the functions and the purpose of trade agreements are there are multiple functions and purposes that a trade agreement uh, could have theoretically. So the uh, one uh, idea is that you need a trade agreement to eliminate negative cross-border externalities. So that is the idea that in terms of, uh, if you choose your trade policy, you may benefit your country by improving your terms of trade or by attracting more firms to your country that is called delocation externality. You impose a trade, uh, uh, trade barrier and you attract more firms into your country because they want to jump over the trade barriers, or you can shift profit to your firms if you have a, a imperfect competition in the in a market. So you can benefit from imposing the trade policy, 
but the cost that you are imposing on the rest of the world is more than the benefit you get. And if they do the same thing, everyone is going to lose. So this is like a prisoner dilemma type of situation. And the mechanism that uh, trade agreements have is to, ex uh, to exchange market access mutually. So that's like mutual tariff costs. But as I mentioned, there is not a great motivation for countries that mainly export oil because market access is not an issue for them. But there are other functions that trade agreements have. One is uh, they work as a commitment device against domestic political pressures. And uh, so it's basically the idea is that governments face a time inconsistency in trade policy preferences because in the short run, they are uh, tempted by pressures from interest groups, lobby groups, and so forth to protect, but they know that in the long run, that's bad for their country. So the mechanism that the agreements uh, provide is to tie the government's hands so that they cannot uh, respond to domestic pressures to, uh, from interest groups. And basically here, uh, the suggestion is that you can use trade agreements to mitigate domestic political problems. Another benefit uh, of trade agreements is, uh, is to reduce uncertainty and increase transparency, uh, transparency of policymaking. This is related to what Daria also mentioned that trade is not trade is like marriage trade is not necessarily a, a, a just one-time transaction or an arm's length transaction uh, in order to have trade especially in if uh, through the supply chain and global value chain you need certainty and you need transparency you, uh, of policy making both domestic entities and international entities they want to make sure that uh, once they enter an enter a contract with a firm uh, policies are not going to change the uh, change their trade-offs. So uh, that's another benefit from uh, trade agreements and the mechanism that is uh, uh, provided by the trade agreements is a bunch of rules and procedures that is uh, the WTO and the GATT have popularized in the world. Everyone are familiar with those and countries that adopt those uh, make it easier for international, for firms uh, to predict the policy making process of a country. So, what's that for five minutes? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, based on what I just mentioned, so there uh, there are some trade policy suggestions for Iran or any uh, major oil exporter that they can adopt. Of course, here I'm assuming that there is a reasonable political system in place, which is unfortunately far from truth right now, but. Uh, in case we have a political system that can uh, start thinking about uh, in, uh, free trade and international trade, there are two uh, major steps that an oil exporting country can take. And let, let me just remind you that an oil exporting country is uh, different from other uh, countries, other uh, developing countries, in the sense that market access is not a major issue, at least uh, at the beginning of the process of uh, globalization for a country. Uh, and that's why the emphasis would be on the, the second and third function of the agreements that I mentioned. Uh, the first suggestion would be, even though you are not part of the WTO, you should act as if you are a WTO member. And uh, that would make Iran's trade policy transparent and predictable. Uh, adopt WTO rules and procedures like tariff binding, uh, in, in which case you, you set a binding, a maximum rate on all of your tariff lines and you would impose tariffs at or below those rates. So that gives, uh, uh, that limits your policy space and uh, sends a signal that you are going to change your policy within, uh, uh, within a reasonable range. And uh, if you want to protect your industries for whatever reason, so you have to go through is contingent protection measures that the WTO has. The WTO has is a very flexible agreement, in fact, and there, there are measures called anti-dumping measures, countervailing duties, safeguards. These are all measures that allow a government to increase their tariffs, but they have to follow certain procedures. They have to make announcements about the reason for doing these things. If Iran adopts these policies, these procedures, even if it is not a WTO member, that would uh, make it easier for uh, foreign companies to predict Iran's uh, policies. And also, 
it helps contain the influence of political interest groups because the political interest groups will have to go through this process and that would reveal a lot of information for the public and uh, potentially corruption could be uh, reduced. And the second suggestion is uh, do not wait for joining the WTO because that's uh, if the uh, case of Saudi Arabia uh, is, uh, uh, contains any information for Iran, the process would be very long and very difficult. So Iran should start uh, entering into bilateral free trade agreements and they have to make it easy and desirable for other countries to enter uh, FTAs with Iran. So Iran should adopt a two column tariff system or could adopt a two column tariff system where you have column one for uh, the most favored nations that these are the countries that enter FDA with, uh, with the country. And then you have a column two tariff, which is for everyone else who is not a part of the W, uh, a part of your uh, uh, free trade agreements. And this system gives more incentive to other countries to enter an FTA because uh, there is a lot of evidence that FTAs have this domino effect that if a country enters FTA with uh, a second country, other countries become more interested in joining uh, that free trade agreement because uh, the countries that are part of the FTAs are going to get uh, preferences. Therefore, other countries become more interested in joining. So, and uh, there are negotiation strategies that Iran can adopt they have to really stay committed to WTO-like procedures. Just act like a WTO member and uh, negotiate your column one tariffs, your MFN tariffs, but keep your other tariffs uh, non-negotiable. So in conclusion, uh, I think I have two, two main conclusions here. One is that there is a significant conflict between WTO's objective and that of major oil exporting developing countries. And uh, Iran, as a oil exporting nation, would need a different strategy to be able to benefit from the WTO and the FTAs. And the strategy is to adopt institutional features of the WTO unilaterally and engage in bilateral trade agreements. And that's uh, what I have for you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Mustafa. Um, I don't know if you have seen it or not, but in Q&A, there have been many interesting exchanges. I can see that my old professor, Hamid Mohtadi, has had exchanges with Daria Nadere, who in a minute will talk to us also, raise the questions or so. And James Roch also asked a question from Eric. Uh, I have to mention that James Roch has published this wonderful book on the economics of the Middle East, which came out about a year and a half ago. If you haven't gotten yourself a copy of that book, I highly encourage you to do that. So it's great to have James here with us. Uh, I am going to ask Kam Yar to uh, go ahead and promote uh, Nadere and others who want to talk here uh, to come up and ask their questions. We have about half an hour left. In particular, Daria has a very hard time that she has to go to another panel in half an hour. We need to make sure that she meets that obligation. So Kam Yar, please go ahead and motivate people uh, so they can ask and raise their questions. Uh, we're going to go to questions that go to Daria first, and then we're going to go to questions that go to Eric and Mustafa. Kamyar, you're in charge. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nader Jun, I think you should be able to put your camera on and, and, and talk. Can you see me and hear me? I am trying to... If you, if you try, if you put your camera on, I think you yeah. should be... Um, it should work now, sorry. <laughs> It should work. Okay. Thank you very much. It's extremely uh, interesting and I'm uh, delighted to have participated in this. Um, I have actually um, a, a three questions into one, if you don't like, or one question of in three parts. Uh, I was very interested. It was very interesting to hear Daria say that, for instance, in order to diversify, you need roughly, if I understood it correctly, Daria, um, a roughly kind of a market size of about, I think, 390 million you mentioned or something. I was just wondering, um, you know, uh, and you, you mentioned that Iran is kind of maybe not, uh, it's kind of off the, or is far and uh, removed. 
Uh, I remember in I used to be at the World Bank you, you, um, uh, during the time when you were when you joined also, and I remember that uh, Inder Mitgill did this uh, uh, did this uh, uh, World uh, Development Report about economic geography, and in this e economic geography there is one thing that that was very interesting to me, uh, and if I can maybe share my screen on on this one um, one. Uh, um, Think uh, where he kind of put uh, put the uh, the world according to market size. You probably have seen that that figure. I don't know how to do it, um, and I'm, I don't want to take too much of your of people's time. But you know, he he did this um, this uh, uh, the world according to market size, and you know, you had one big balloon which was the uh, which was East Asia, another big balloon which was. Uh, 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 Europe, and in the middle was, of course, Iran. So in other words, Iran, if, uh, if from the economic geography perspective, could have access to very large market, uh, markets, and as a result, could have been, you know, well placed to be, um, to, to diversify. Of course, other countries like Turkey have benefited from that location, but Iran hasn't. So I would like, if you can maybe um, talk a little bit about that. The, uh, my other question is that do we really, does the Middle East suffer from a Middle East exception uh, when it comes to a sort of like resource and non-resource based? When I was at the World Bank in the middle, in the chief economist office, every every report we, which we wrote, we were talking about, well, how does the resource rich uh, MENA country differ from the non-resource uh, re resource rich? And how does like you know I don't know uh, labor intensive versus non labor intensive differ? And in the end, they all had the same problems. They all didn't generate in, uh, enough uh, jobs. They all were not. I, I mean, let's say from uh, there was not very much of a difference between a Tunisia and let's say Iran, and there was not a, much of a difference between Egypt and Iran. So in other words, there, uh, it seems that many of these. Um, let's say many of these assumptions that you know if, if you are a resource rich versus a resource poor you follow certain kinds of economic i don't know let's say uh, circumstances perhaps doesn't really apply to to mena or why is mena so different than other countries and the last question that i have i'm sorry we are talking a lot about uh, you know dutch disease but for the last 10 10 12 years because of the uh, of the uh, sanctions, Iran doesn't really, hasn't really benefited from its oil ex, uh, exports. Do we still, does Iran still suffer from the Dutch disease or is, does Iran now suffer from an Iranian disease, which is totally, uh, I mean, uh, you know, messed up policies, uh, uh, captured, uh, you know, state capture of, of its industry and so on. Sorry, I met, put in too many questions, but uh, the, the session has been very interesting and thank you so much. I will mute myself and get out of thank the you, screen. Nadira. Thank uh, you so much. Daria, please, floor is yours. Okay, thanks. So um, I, I wanted to address um, the follow-up question by Hamid Motadi uh, on the chat, and then I will try to pick uh, on one of the questions of uh, Nadere. Um, so let, let me start perhaps with Nadere, uh, or just because we've just been hearing from her. Um, so uh, I actually do agree that Iran, uh, by an economic geography point of view, is well positioned. And actually, if we think of those the der determinants, you know, endowments, um, uh, market access, um, institutions, geography, so I think really the, the sticky point is perhaps institution and this integration into the into the global economy. And that's why I really I was really interested in what Mustafa was saying of behave as if you were a WTO member, even if you are not. And I think we have a great example of uh, you know having done this unilateral trade uh, policy successful in the past with India, right? That hasn't really signed many deep trade agreements, but actually as understood that a lot of the benefits are on facilitating imports into your country. So I think that really uh, probably Iran would be well placed uh, indeed for a lot of the underlying 
drivers and 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 uh, you know and and perhaps sorting this institutional dimension is really important. The other point, and I think is just my little contribution to, to your question on the MENA exception, is that at least to participate in this type of long-standing repeated relationships, you need some kind of certainty. So, you know, predictability is key. And so, for instance, uh, we did some exercise of, you know, simulating what was like in different regions of the world, the, the, the endowment that was really missing and with MENA was really coming this political stability, but really in terms of certainty of, you know, of predictability of allowing companies to invest in long-term relationships and, and sunk costs that cannot be recovered with, with uh, you know, with, with some capacity to predict and to achieve some kind of revenue stream. So that's, um, that's, I think, that um, it's what I have to say on those questions. And then Hamid, actually, when uh, in the chat, he was asking if uh, human capital, the existing domestic endowment in human capital makes a difference in determining the productivity of uh, the firms that both import and export. And so initially, I thought it was more on the econometrics. And I was saying, oh, you, look, we control for that with fixed effects. And we see a differential effect for this type of firms compared uh, to other firms controlling for that. But then he came back and he said, yeah, OK, but that's uh, what I really am curious about is uh, whether when we interact the existing human capital endowment and the spillover effect from import to export firms to other firms, what happens? And so what I wanted to say um, is that indeed, uh, what he's mentioning, it's important because I think there is two pieces to this international engagement. You will have your national frontier firms that will engage with the global frontier firms. And then there will be a buildup in uh, human capital that will happen in this frontier firms. But then how much this will lead to development depends on domestic networks. So in the past, I happened to estimate that and the, let's say the laggards or the average firm in the country doesn't respond to shocks, positive or negative shocks at the global frontier. Doesn't really care if uh, AT&T is doing a new innovation. The, the, the national frontier firm does, but what the rest of the network of firms responds to is what happens at the national frontier firms. So, you basically, this debate of developing domestically or internationally, I think it's a spurious debate. It's two legs of the same development strategy. We need to strengthen the international networks and we need to strengthen, strengthen the domestic networks. And of course, the more your domestic human capital is strong, the more you will then be able to create that ecosystem of domestic firms that will be able to generate the spillovers. And I think that's really the lesson from Asia. No? Where all the Asian successful Asian countries have all hugely invested in education and those that at some point is invested uh, or, or sort of privatized it by, you know, basically they created, you know, they had the drop in quality like Malaysia, they had the sort of a bit of a setback and so, you know, this, this human capital and uh, it's key. Thanks. Next up, Peter. Thank you, Daria. Uh, wonderful questions from Nader and a wonderful question from Hamid. Uh, there is a question which is raised to Eric. I first would like to read that question. And then after that, Ramin is gonna be promoted because he has questions to Mustafa and Eric. So Eric, the question is raised by, um, if I pronounce this correctly, Ariane Manofi Niazi. I hope that I didn't drop any academic uh, titles there. Ariane is asking, what is your opinion about the impact of climate change and the future of the oil industry on diversification in resource dependent countries? A hot topic. These countries may want to export oil as much as they can and invest in renewable industries it will show up in diversification by some lags. If possible, uh, oh, Ramin says that I can just read his question and then you and Mustafa can address that question. He doesn't want to uh, address that uh, publicly. So uh, let me go to the question for Mustafa and Eric. By the way, Eric, hot question on climate policy. 
please make sure that you address that. Now, this question is raised by my good friend, uh, Ramin Nasehi, who is asking, uh, do you think sanctions, this is a question going to Eric and Mostafa, do you think sanctions have actually had a positive impact on economic diversification in Iran in the past decade through encouraging import substitution? Eric, you begin. Mostafa, please follow up afterwards. Floor is yours. Well, thanks. These are both fantastic questions and really go to the heart at some of what are the some of the issues that we've been uh, discussing. So with respect to the climate change question from Ariane, I think um, maybe I'll make three points. One is that there's there's the potential obvious one, which is there may be stranded assets. So the, the oil or hard hydrocarbon producing um, assets will, will likely be there beyond the demand for them. Now, however, there's a caveat with, with that as, as, as your question indicates, which is we don't know what the price path of oil will be before it's stopped using. If there's less investment in, in for example, by publicly traded uh, uh, multinational oil firms, then we could actually see the supply demand imbalance leading to a higher price uh, in the short run and potentially large profits in that. So we, we're, we don't really know what's gonna happen over the next 20, 30 years, even if we do over the next 100. Uh, a second point is that we might see a separation between metal rich uh, uh, countries and hydrocarbon rich countries, uh, which could lead to both economic differences. So those countries that are that are making nickel and copper and, and the metals of, that will power the renewable transition versus those that, that have been uh, leading to fossil fuel uh, burning and emission. And that could lead to both economic differences in terms of their exports and the, 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 the the incentives for diversification, um, but also differences in politics, which would bring me to the last piece, which is around not just the global uh, political importance of these countries, but the domestic ones. I'm sure you've everyone here in this in this panel has heard about the concept of a rentier state, which is when there's a large natural resource, the government gets to kind of produce or share in the production, tax it, and then distribute goodies to the population in exchange for their acquiescence, as compared to a resource poor political economy where the government collects taxes, but it has to provide services in return. And, and uh, you know, public economists uh, and political scientists believe there's greater state citizen accountability in that format. But then what happens when you move from a country that's built around that rentier distributive state model to one in which there has to be more give and take. It's not simply switching from oil and gas to solar if the fundamental relationship between business and government has to change. And that could be smooth and, and, and technocratic and lovely, or it could be potentially traumatic and, uh, and even violent. So I think that's something that'll depend on each country and each constituency. Um, the question from uh, uh, Ramin in terms of sanctions, I, I, I can't answer this. Um, uh, for Iran, but let me just give an example from, from Sub-Saharan Africa, which is trade costs, which is kind of a similar thing. You probably all, all know that the cost of getting a container into somewhere like a landlocked Sub-Saharan African country like Malawi is just, you know, multiples and multiples higher than it is trading between two uh, port, you know, busy ports uh, uh, across the world from one another. And what that has is kind of, it's, it's almost, it, it increases the, it's like a, um, a, a tariff on an imported good, which can lead to more diversification of the domestic economy. But what, what I think I've seen uh, across different countries is that what you get are the, the light industries like making mattresses or uh, cement that aren't really that sophisticated or value added. And if the broader political economy isn't one in which there's all these amazing uh, you know, trade agreements and, and, and policy rules that Mustafa has indicated, but you still have that same political dynamic of a poor and resource dependent countries, then when you just have a, you know, a mattress producer, you end up with a mattress producer with exclusivity in some domain. And so they might be able to make more stuff, but they're not productive. They're not engaged in the global value chains that, that Darius described. And uh, so it might, it might be diversification and maybe in the long run, it's, it's, it's building capabilities. But uh, it, I think it's tough to build a, a broader economic transformation around those kinds of opportunities. Mustafa, if possible, I would like you to continue with that train of yeah. thought. 
just like uh, what Eric said, it's difficult to say whether uh, Iran's economy has actually diversified. There is a lot of anecdote that Iranian, uh, like textile industry, for example, has grown a little bit because of uh, the sanctions, because it's very costly to import textile. So the question is whether that's going to translate into long-term growth in, uh, in the case that sanctions are removed, are they going to survive or not? That I think that's a difficult question to answer. But uh, like Eric, I can also give an example. Uh, actually, this time from Iran. Iran was under sanctions uh, a few hundred years ago uh, for export of uh, uh, silk, and it was the sanctions that were imposed by uh, Ottomans, and Iran could not export silk, and Iran had a big capacity of producing silk. And the industrial policy that the government uh, chose at the time was to produce uh, carpets. And during that time, a lot of uh, carpet uh, designs were uh, introduced and that did have a long, uh, long-term long effect, but uh, it could have a long-term effect in general, but I'm not sure if in the current climate that we are in, that translates into uh, diversification in, in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. So uh, Hamid has a question and he is going to be promoted in a minute. Also, uh, Hashem Pesaran has raised a very interesting question and I think that uh, should be um, raised here. And uh, Hashem will also be promoted if he wants to, otherwise I can read his question. Uh, in the meantime, let's go to Hamid. And I have to remind you that uh, Daria has a very hard timeline here. She's going to be with us less than 15 minutes, so make sure that you manage your time properly. Hamid, so good to see you. Floor is yours. Hello, Saleh. Thank you so much for, uh, for moderating this. Wonderful to see you as well. And uh, a quick a note of thanks to Daria for, for, uh, uh, for clarifying the role of human capital. It is a complicated one, both as a, as a cause and effect. So there's Obviously, econometrically is a mess, it's an endogeneity question and so on. But you, you did a, uh, uh, you know, you understood the, the gist of my question. You answered it very, very well. Uh, I do have a question for Eric, actually. And uh, uh, it seems to be a small world. Uh, Michael Ross and I have several papers on, on uh, these very same political economy questions that, that you raised. Um, and uh, one of them, actually, that it was about the role of the state in, in, in uh, oil economies uh, and was, that came in uh, economics and politics a couple of years ago, um, uh, was, had a model about how governments in uh, uh, oil rich, uh, oil dependent economies uh, tend to uh, not depend on, on taxation and therefore, you know, the whole uh, the transparency problem becomes, uh, be become opaque because they don't need to open up to the public and all that. What we found in the empirics of that paper was that those results seem to be much stronger when you think about when, when on oil economies than resource economies at large. We also did another paper that's still sort of in working paper stages on uh, just transparency, and the same thing happened. Uh, we found whatever we found that sometimes results help for resource economies, resource economies, but often results were much stronger when we focused on oil. And it kind of made, I guess, intuitive sense. You know, oil is an intensive, uh, ec economically intensive resource. I was wondering if uh, in your work with Michael Ross or your own work uh, separately, you came across this distinction between oil as an intensive, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, product that, that kind of distorts the political economy to a much greater extent versus resources at large. Uh, and so uh, I was just curious whether whether that was an observation you also found in your work or not. Uh, thanks, and nice to see you. And I've seen your papers, of course. So that's uh, I appreciate oh, thank the, you. Uh, the question. Um, so we, uh, I, I guess, let me just say two things quickly. One is that when we did look in, at the sub-Saharan Africa sample, our strongest diversifiers were Botswana and Zambia both mineral dependent countries um, and as opposed to uh, oil rich. And, and uh, yeah, we didn't go into the details of it, but that was certainly, you know, that was, that was in, the, in, our, in our heads whether oil was different. And, and in the case of, of Sub-Saharan Africa, 
both both um, Botswana and Zambia had the strongest measures of diversification, and they had the best governance uh, records. Now, like everybody else, their governance didn't necessarily improve that much, except for a couple random outliers that you know went from really bad to a little bit bad. Um, but uh, you know, so then our, we had to sort of theorize, although that paper wasn't wasn't about theory theory building, but but we would probably theorize that the level of governance does, even if not the change in governance enables that uh, the more diverse activities to emerge in an easier fashion. So I think there's some agreement uh, for sure with that. And then just the second part of the answer would be my experience working with with uh, around um, uh, resource taxation and advising uh, countries in, in concession agreements and, and distinguishing between production sharing with oil and then usual ta ta taxation for minerals. The government take in the oil sector, well, first, as you mentioned, oil is a bigger thing than, than minerals in almost every case. And even once you go to minerals, we think, oh yeah, gold and diamonds are worth so much, but actually the biggest uh, products in minerals are coal and uh, iron ore. So it's just it's just a question of volume as opposed to actual value with a couple exceptions like Botswana and diamonds. Um, so so yeah, it's the money is where the big stuff is oil's the biggest and then kind of coal and iron ore and then you get down to copper and then finally like what's really valuable is 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 less important. But the government take for any of these projects is way higher in oil than it is in the minerals. It could be, you know, 50, 70, 90% in oil right. and five, eight, 10, 12% in, uh, in minerals. And so you multiply that times a smaller number and then you just end up with one being a more significant contributor to the, to the economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just, just to, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, basically stress the, the point. Uh, basically, it seems that the, the extent to which the polity is distorted uh, it is much greater in terms of the you know, opacity and so on when when we look when we look at oil versus when we look at other other minerals that was sort of uh, what what we found yeah. but thank you so much for clarifying and, and basically supporting that that uh, finding as well thank you hamid um you. the next question okay. will be raised by hashem pesaran I would like uh, Daria to comment on this question and also conclude her talk because I know that she has to leave soon. And then after that, I do want Mustafa to please continue commenting on Hashem's question. Hashem, if you can hear me, floor is yours. Well, actually, I wrote that. Thanks so much indeed, very important topic. Uh, my main question is that actually when a country like Iran is under sanction, or when, for other reason, the economic expansion is not taking place, so the economy is in stagnation, let's call it, not down at all, even. When obviously that could force uh, some kind of a diversification, but that's not really a structural diversification. I was wondering whether in the analysis you do, in empirical analysis, you can, you can sort of distinguish countries, uh, if you do cross-sectional countries, find out which ones were actually were under duress, as it were, uh, and which one weren't, or for economic cycle and see whether diversification is still, uh, uh, you know, as an, becomes an important issue. I mean, I, so I know I'm very diff have difficulty defining what diversification is when Iran under sanction. If you cannot export oil, <laughs> in other words, you, you, your income from oil declines, you are 20% of the whole of the uh, revenues from government come from oil only at the moment, uh, as far as I know. So. What does it mean they are diversifying? So I think the way to think about it maybe is the sectors which not which were uh, sort of not the whole country, but look at maybe you were doing it. I don't really know. I mean that's a question I have. Uh, and also I was worried. I was just since I have a chance. I mean I think the whole dosh disease. I talked to Ross, uh, who is a co-author of Eric. I mean it doesn't make sense for a country that's got 40 or 100 years of oil. I mean this is the dosh disease referred to unexpected. Uh, uh, gain, I mean, which happened in uh, when, ga when gas was discovered in, in, in Holland. So I, I'm a bit concerned about uh, a convolution of the, these ideas, really, for Iranian economy. Basically, Iran is under sanction. Iran has got 100 years of oil. So whether we do allow for these two fundamental facts, then we do this empirical analysis in general and then related to Iran. I, I just was wondering. Daria? 
floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, um, um, so I, I totally agree that so whether um, we are in periods of expansion or stagnation changes, I mean, my in or my in is more to uh, to think that perhaps it's mostly changing about on, on, on the level, the degree of structural transformation, but some of the qualitative relationships will remain because in periods of stagnation, you will still have, uh, you know, the creation of new activities. And, and that's why I think that even um, in the two states so still, uh, uh, you know, these drivers, and again, I stress institutions, policy can, can go a long way. I think that, um, I guess, my, my concern about the actual economy is too, which I want to put it out. One is that there is an endogenous relationship between uh, um, uh, you know, what we are doing from a geopolitical point of view at the global level. So this sort of less predictable global environment and regional environment in some context and how much uh, the macroeconomic or, or, or global growth uh, will be affected. So I think this endogenous relationship is bringing subdued Microeconomic growth, and then that can can open a vicious cycle. No, we have less returns, uh, more skepticism, and then we. So that I think it's at the global level. That's I really think it's a, it's a risk we are seeing, and I think actually uh, the high indebtedness uh, following COVID will only make this more difficult. And then the second point I wanted to make, and this is really about this landscape of global firms and so on, what I see from my viewpoint is that there is uh, a strong consolidation in most sectors. So there are less firms around. There is much more specialization. So specific firms specialize much more and, you know, and collaborate more to be able to do something. Even the giants like Facebook, Google, and so on, there would be nobody if they weren't sitting on the shoulders or of other giants that we don't even know the name and those are all globally dispersed but ultimately in every activity you see that the, the market is becoming extremely consolidated and the one or two firms just control the global market of that so my point is a late camera of like iran will will is china the model i don't think so i don't think anybody will reproduce the experience of china Perhaps India is a better model. And, and that's where I think this human capital dimension becomes really important to me. But I, I definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the experience of India because I see perhaps more lessons to be learned for latecomers to development or to the transition out of commodities than let's say the China model. Okay, I stop it here and I'm really Thank sorry you. that I need to go. It has been wonderful, and I hope this is the first of a series of interactions with you all. Thank you so very much, Daria. It was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, my trainings in Germany, Kamiar John, would tell me that I should have stopped here. My trainings in Iran and the US would tell me to ask Eric and Mustafa if they have time that we carry on a bit. But Mustafa is still, I would like to, I would like to ask you to please comment on Hashem's concern. Uh, we say goodbye to Daria. We continue Daria. with Mustafa. And then after that, we will uh, carry over to Kamyar to make a decision upon this. So Mustafa, motivated by Hashem's question, I would like to add one small element. Let's say that sanctions are over. Let's say that policymakers in Iran are going to behave like a WTO uh, member and they're gonna go with these two column tariffs. Do you anticipate that such transformation would transform Iran's economy by first transformation, I mean, policy transformation, would transform Iran's economy away from heavily engaged in service activities where more than half of value added is coming from services sector towards more uh, industrial activities, getting away from what Danny Rodrick calls the premature deindustrialization. Do you actually anticipate that? The floor is yours. Yeah, I think a, a predictable uh, trade policy system is necessary but not sufficient for those uh, changes to occur. But if you, if you want to engage in 
global supply chain because apparently, I mean, according to uh, most studies, if you want to grow fast in this uh, world, you need to engage in, product, in a, a global value chains, basically, which means that you have to import intermediate goods and you have to export manufacturing goods. And a necessary step would be to make your policies predictable. And I think, yes, I mean, following those uh, WTO-like procedures uh, would be a necessary step in the sense that uh, you make your policy transparent and uh, predictable and you try to avoid protectionist pressures in the short run. But whether that is sufficient for uh, fast growth, uh, I cannot say that, but it seems to me that uh, it, it is a necessary step to take. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So. Uh, we spent about 90 minutes. Uh, I have many questions left. I think that there are a few things that are mentioned by audience. Last thing that I would like to mention is raised by Kayvon Hosseini Vand, or Hossein Vand. I'm sorry if I dropped an academic title here. Uh, this is not a question, it's just a reminder. Because of the sanctions, Kayvon says, Iran has been forced to spend most, most of, much of its resources on production of sanctioned goods. That is why there are not many resources left to produce the products and export them. To conclude then, Eric, I would like to first begin with you and then go to Mustafa. Let's say that you're sitting in front of a policymaker, an influential policymaker in Iran. What are your most important advices if you want to put them in at most three pieces of advice to policymakers in such country? I will then extend the same question to Mustafa. Floor is yours, Eric. Good question. Um, first, pleading my ignorance uh, on Iran. I'm, I'm, I'm less familiar with it, with it than probably everyone in the room, but I guess broad pieces of advice would be um, and this stems from the political economy work uh, with Lant and, and Kunal, which is one is listen to your exporters and domestic businesses that you want to hear from, not from the ones that come into the room. The ones who come into the room are going to be the ones who depend on uh, firm specific advantage on uh, on on uh, differential taxation or, or, or licenses. Uh, and in other words, they depend on uh, some discretionary rents from the state in order for their advantage. So naturally they've got the best government relations. But if you wanna diversify your economy, you have to cater to the preferences of the firms that are, are trying to ignore you as much as possible. So that's a, that's a challenge. So you want the ones who are making more complex products who are doing probably more processing or, or even on the service side and who don't necessarily have a government interface, but their preferences are, should, should direct uh, the kinds of uh, sectors you want to develop. Um, obviously the sanctions has to be a big part of it. I don't know the right way uh, around that. I defer to, to Mustafa on that, uh, so that to align the incentives of your firms uh, with the proper um, price signals. Um, uh, there is a possibility to develop the wrong types of businesses or, you know, they, they might be right for a sanctions period, but then they, they might not be competitive once uh, those firms have the same global opportunities that they would in the absence of them. Um, though there's always a, a back piece to that, like with India's big uh, conglomerates, many of them have been quite successful as India, uh, you know, reduced some of the permit, uh, permit Raj. Um, and then, yeah, the final part, I guess, would be to uh, focus as much on political uh, voice and accountability as on the economic policies, because that's really what enables the economic actors uh, to be able to, um, you know, iterate towards uh, a more effective regulatory environment that will allow them to thrive on the basis of, of market forces as opposed to uh, political favors. Uh, before you wrap up, Eric, there's a question raised to you, mostly raised to your co-author. 
can you talk, Aliye Nohtani says, can you talk a bit about the connection between female empowerment and also Iran being a rich country in oil? Uh, I, I, I know that you have given us your three points, but since this relates to what uh, Ross has done, I know that you may not necessarily uh, represent his views, but I want to also hear from you. What do you think about that? It's not something I've done uh, done research on, so I wouldn't uh, wouldn't presume to be able to answer uh, it with the authority of of having looked at the data and thought thought hard about it. Um, but I I think it, it I guess my first inclination would be that it would come back to that Grantier state model, and when there are oil riches, it reduces the the uh, symbiotic accountability between government and citizenry and would enable more exclusive economic arrangements, both exclusive with respect to certain sectors that we might call crony capitalists that can support the regime in exchange for helping to promote that, that acquiescence by the population. But it also could be broader societal uh, divisions um, and enabling more of a patriarchal system, for example, or, or an age-based or particular ethnicities that might have a greater role in protecting the uh, the uh, government or regime from from potential challenges and and I and I can see gender easily fitting uh, into into that uh, answer as well thank you Eric uh to Ali uh, Michael Ross has this very awesome book called the oil curse how petroleum wealth shapes the development of nations and I think you may find some very interesting answers to the concern the very interesting concern that you raise in that book now to conclude the entire session Mustafa I'm going to raise the same question to you an influential policymaker in front of you from Iran you have three or more advices for them what are those conclude the session please I always have a problem with this kind of questions because we know that the political system in Iran right now, they, the problem there is not uh, policy making, right? So there is this political problem that regardless of uh, what political, uh, what policy advice you give the government, nothing is going to change. I think that uh, it would be a rather a mistake to emphasize uh, policy because of these issues. Like we have been talking about joining the WTO or international trade, whereas the simple problem right now is uh, the sanctions that are completely political and um, but related to K1's question I think uh, one point that is quite interesting is that in fact right now the incentives to export is a lot more than before the sanctions because of the effect of sanctions on the exchange rate a lot of uh, farmers for example find it very profitable to export and uh, one of the reasons that the export looks more diversified now is because uh, it's actually quite a lot more profitable compared to the past to export, although Iran cannot produce very complex products because they cannot import the required intermediate goods and so forth. But I don't think that it is true that uh, because of sanctions, uh, exports would go, uh, there would be like this incentive to export. So there is a lot of resources that are uh, shifted towards pr producing for domestic consumption, but also given the exchange rate, there's a lot of incentive to export. And in some cases, the government even tries to restrict exports to bring back those products to be consumed uh, domestically. And let me not give any policy advice, as I said, it, I think it's uh, misplaced. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so very much. On uh, your points regarding uh, exports during uh, sanctions, I would like to highlight the importance of a paper by Jamal Haydar, who is at Harvard and uh, University of Cairo. He has this paper called Sanctions and Export Deflection Evidence from Iran, which was published in Economic Policy. Uh, the journal for CEPR uh, back in 2017. I personally enjoyed reading that paper and I will refer that to anyone who wants to read more about this matter. This was an absolute honor. I know that Daria is not here. Hopefully she's gonna watch the recorded session. This was an absolute honor for me to have Daria, Eric and Mustafa here. I know that there is a lot that we can talk about. However, I am uh, about 10 minutes out of time here. 
Kamya, thank you for allowing us to have this conversation here. You can wrap up the entire session. Thank, thank you guys on behalf of the IIA. Thank you so much. And I, I have, uh, as, as usual, uh, every month I learn new things and this has uh, clearly been a, a very, very interesting webinar and I've, I've certainly learned new things. So thank you for everybody who stayed with us just to tell you a, a little bit of, and thank you so much Sola, for actually doing all the hard work of organizing uh, everything and, and uh, moderating so nicely. My uh, just, pleasure. Just as a reminder, uh, we, do, we have these weekly webinars. Next one is in February, 9th of February, and it's going to be on climate change and Iran. Uh, we have a series of um, uh, interesting uh, speakers. Um, and following that, we'll have a, a session in March on sanctions in the Iranian economy. Um, and then after that, an, another webinar in April on uh, long-term energy market prospects implications for Iran and so on and so forth. So I hope you will join us for, for our uh, usual slot on Wednesday, second Wednesdays of each month. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to everybody who raised such interesting questions. And thank you to the panelists and Daria, who, who's not with us anymore. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, you guys. <laughs>